So I want you to be honest. What was your gut reaction when you read the title to this video? What like did you immediately think? I want you to write it in the comments and I want to know for real. I'm Kayla Goldstein. I run Questioning the Answers and today I want to talk about what Jews are valid and about Jewish unity. Okay, so hear me out. Something that I've been talking about a lot over the past two weeks and I finally just decided to put it into a coherent YouTube video. Also, I wanted it to be shareable. Low key. So Instagram stories aren't shareable. Okay, so let's go into Perm for a second. Let's just backtrack a few days and go into Perm for a second. When Haman decided that he wanted to kill the Jews, and this is basically how the Perm story kind of starts, he goes to Ahasuerus and he's trying to describe the Jews to Ahasuerus. And he's like, this is a nation that is divided and scattered across your entire kingdom. They are not together, right? It's not one country. It's not one group. They are scattered throughout the entire kingdom. And Ahasuerus actually fights Haman back, right? We know that Ahasuerus fights back. He's like, I don't think that we can kill them. He's not so sure that killing the Jews is a good idea. He's like, their God is really stinking powerful. I'm a little nervous to take them on. And Haman's response to Ahasuerus is, yeah, but they're not together. They're sinning and they're not united. So they are currently destructible. If we take this opportunity and jump on it, then we are going to be able to win the Jewish people. Now, the perm story happens. We know the perm story. Fast forward, Mordechai comes to Esther and Esther agrees to save the Jews, but she says, fine, but first go ask all the Jews to fast and pray for three days. Why did she do this? Because the reason that they were able to put out this decree against the Jewish people was because we were separated and divided. By fasting and praying together, she was bringing the Jewish people back together so that she would have that foundation of unity to go on and go to Ahasuerus and not be killed. They come together, they fast, she goes, we know the rest of the perm story. Fast forward a whole bunch more, the end of the perm story, and Esther comes to Ahasuerus again, and she says, listen, I really appreciate everything that you've done, but there are still these letters that are telling people that they can kill the Jews, and they're still out there. Can you annul that? Can you cancel those letters? And Ahasuerus looks at her, and he says, I can't. I've done everything I can. The rest is in your hands. And he gives him permission to kill back and fight back. And at this point, Esther cries. This is the first time that it's documented that Esther cried. She was an orphan. We don't know that she cried. She was rounded up. They don't tell us she cried. She was selected to be queen and forever going to be living in the palace. Didn't cry. She was sent to the king and risked her life. She didn't cry. She was at the party and dramatically pointing out Haman and saying, he wants to kill me. She didn't cry. Why did she cry now? If she's like this strong warrior woman who never cries, why did she cry when Ahasuerus said, you can fight back, but I can't annul the decree? And the reason, according to Rabbani Kimima Mizrahi, is because she saw a prophecy. She understood that the decree that Jews can be killed cannot be taken back because the Jews were not united. Yes, they united for those three days, and because of that, in this specific situation, they were saved. But she saw a prophecy that down the line, Jews will still be able to be killed, and there's going to be a second exile because Jews are not going to be united. And she cried because she understood that that letter, that Jews can be destroyed, is still out there. She said, it's in your hands until we decide to come together. And this was Esther's prophecy. And this was what Esther said. And this is why she went and fought to get the Megillah written and added to Tanakh. And she had to fight. Like, it was not simple to put it in. But we have this idea from the Perm story of the Jews being in real danger of being destroyed, coming together, being saved, but not being able to stay together, being going back to being divided, and this bringing on the second destruction of the temple, the second exile, which we know was only because of sinas chinam, baseless hatred, which is not baseless as in I don't have a reason to hate you, which is baseless as in I don't have a good reason to hate you, right? And we can go into very recent current events where there were two terrorist attacks in Israel where brothers were murdered and we have these two little boys who were murdered just waiting for the bus. We have these two older boys who were murdered in Israel and they were both brothers and they even had the same name and they were very close together. And it's like Hashem is literally trying so hard to send us a message of let's just 
love each other. We are all brothers. We are all brothers and sisters. And we need to really fundamentally get along because otherwise we're in trouble. So the mother of these two little boys got up and she spoke and she said, so many people came to visit her while she was sitting Shiva. And every single type of Jew felt her pain. Everybody felt bad for her. Nobody said she deserves it. Nobody said, I don't care. She's Haredi. I don't care. Nobody cared that she was Haredi. Everybody cared that her sons died. And this is something that she said. She's like, there are so many mothers in Israel who have lost their children. And every single time the Jewish nation comes together in support for that mother. But they never stick. It never stays. And she was saying, I don't want my children to die in vain. Why can't it stay? And then this was a question that was just like echoing in my head. I was like, why can't it stay? So I opened the conversation on Instagram. And I started like talking about it to people. So I have a few thousand followers on Instagram. It's not a gigantic Instagram account. But I have a very engaged audience. So when I post, I get a lot of conversations in my messages. And I get to talk to a lot of different types of people and have real conversations with them about the same thing, which makes me get to a lot of different points of view, which is a very cool position to be in because I'm getting told things from all the different points of view. And I get to see the full picture or a bigger picture, obviously not the full picture, but a bigger picture, right? And what was very interesting was that across the board, Everyone who messaged me, from the secret Instagram accounts in KJ, to the people who have absolute total religious trauma, to reformed Jews, to completely unaffiliated secular Jews, to people who are not sure if they're Jewish, to converts, I had across the board the same summary, the same conclusion came out of almost all the conversations, and it was that it is all based on fear. All the people who had hatred or disrespect or any kind of negative feeling towards groups that were more religious than them or more strict than them, let's just say that, they were always afraid that they would impose their views on them. It was a fear that you're going to impose your view on me and I don't want to keep the Torah the way that you keep the Torah. Don't impose your view on me. And people who were here and were hating on people who were less stringent, I don't know how to word this, bear with me, Um, they were afraid that we would assimilate and die out or that they would have a bad influence on their own community and bring people away who will assimilate and die out. It was all fair based. And when you think about it, when you think about this fair, it doesn't make any sense. If you're afraid that the less religious people are going to assimilate and make us die out, like, do you believe in God? Do you have faith in God? Because God promised us that we would never die out. He promised us that we are the chosen people forever. So if you believe in God and you believe that God's going to make sure we don't assimilate, we didn't assimilate until now. It's been a lot of years. It's been thousands of years and we haven't assimilated. From wherever you want to start counting from, it has been thousands of years. And we haven't assimilated yet. We haven't died out yet. One of my friends on Instagram messaged me. She said, people are so afraid that we're going to die out. She's a reformed Jew. She said, I'm fourth generation a Jew. My children are fifth generation Jews. They are absolutely completely Jewish. They were mother after daughter Jewish. And she said, my my great grandparents came to America and they were not Shomer Shabbos. They didn't keep Shabbos. They ate lobster. And we're fifth generations and we're still proudly Jewish with full Jewish bloodline. So this fear of assimilation and dying out, if it hasn't happened yet, and if you have faith in God, it's not going to happen. And it's not your job to make sure it doesn't happen. You don't need to micromanage God. You need to do your best. And your best can be to be a beacon of light. Your best can be to inspire. I have a very open home and we keep the Torah the way that we believe is best for our souls to keep the Torah. And if somebody is watching us and somebody comes and they're inspired to go find their best way to keep the Torah, hallelujah. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, you don't keep it exactly like me, so you need to stay away. No, absolutely not. We do our best and we inspire other people to do their best. And that's it. And if you're afraid that more religious people are going to impose their view on you, people who keep things more stringently than you are going to try and impose their view on you, here's where I want to bring in my own history into play. Because... When I was questioning how religious I want to be, if I want to be religious, and what I believe in, 
I was married. I was married with two children. I was married to a rabbi. And my husband never, it never crossed his mind that maybe we should get divorced, that maybe this is going to be an issue. This is a direct quote from him, but I really think that it's really the point here. He said, I was so secure in my relationship with Hashem. Your relationship with Hashem has no reflection on my relationship with Hashem. If you want to keep things a certain way, do it. I'm secure in the way that I am in a relationship with Hashem. I am secure in the way that I connect to my Creator. I am secure in the way that I keep the Torah. I have my guidance. I have my rabbis. I have my mentors. I have the people that I listen to, the way, the path that I take. I am secure in the fact that what I do is my best and what I do is the best that my soul needs. And I'm on the path that my soul needs. And I am not threatened by you being more stringent or by you being more lenient because I am secure in the way that I serve and I know that the way that I serve is the best way for my soul to serve. I don't need to feel threatened by people who are less and me wanting to be like them or my kids wanting to be like them and I don't have to feel threatened by people who are more and are going to try to impose their view on me. If you're secure and you understand that every single Jew ha it can take their own path because everybody has a different soul and a different mission and a different path that they're going to take to connect to the Creator, it's not going to bother you that there are people on different paths because you're on your right path, right? Let's take a zoom out a little bit for a second and let's ask, is it really okay for there to be Jews on different paths? Or is there one way and one path and one group of Jews that is doing it correctly and everybody else is either too extreme or too lenient? Is this, a, is this valid, right? Let's go back to the title of this YouTube video. Our, what type of Jew is valid? And we literally have the answer in our tradition, in our heritage, right? We have so many times that the Torah talks about there being multiple ways. We have Hanukkah Na'al Pidarko. We have Shivim Panam Lator. We have Elu Velu Divrealim Chaim. We have so many times that the Torah tells us that it is so totally valid. Because everybody's soul is going to connect in a different way. When Hashem, when Moshe brought down the luchos, it tells us that the luchos were able to be seen from both sides. When he came down on the mountain, there's a mountain. And the mountain is round. And the Jews were standing all around the mountain. They weren't standing in front of the mountain, in back of the mountain. And when the luchos came down and the Torah came down, everybody saw it from a different point of view. There was one Torah but everybody saw it from a different point of view. And all those point of views were valid. We had 12 Shvatim. And later on, after we came back from, from Galas, and when Esther's grandson built the base of Mik or Esther's son, Daryavish, built the base of Mikdash, and everybody came back after 70 years, they all came back with different traditions because they had all been scattered and divided around the kingdom. They were Amifuzam and Farad. So they were learning the traditions, but each one interpreted it a little bit different, and each one was influenced by the surroundings a little bit differently, and each one understood it differently. And when they came back to Israel, they were all keeping it differently, and it was confusing. And Rav Shimon Atzadik, who was the last of the Anshik Nesagadola, who was the leader at the time, said, as long as you don't contradict the Torah, as long as you can trace it back to Moshe Rabbeinu, it's valid. And not only is it valid, but the next generation came along and some of the children wanted to go to that community and some of the children wanted to go to that community and not stay where their parents were. And he said, it's valid. It's valid. You don't have to stay in the community you were born in. You can change communities. There are, there are parameters to what's considered a valid community. It has to be accepted by the general larger Jewish population. It has to be big enough that it's a known community. It can't just be a group of 10 people. That's like not really accepted. And it can't contradict the Torah. And it has to go all the way back to Moshe. You have to be able to trace it back to Moshe. There are these parameters. At, once you pass those parameters, you can switch communities and all of those communities are valid. So we have a situation where we are a religion, we are a nation, and a culture that has many different tribes, 70, 12, 120, the number that you want to pick from tradition or history or go do searches now. We have many different tribes and all of those tribes are valid and every single person needs to find what tribe their soul belongs to, get really secure there, and then completely and totally respect all the other tribes as equally valid. It's not for me. 
It's not for me, but nobody's trying to make it for me. It's equally valid. I'm not going to try to force those people to come over here and I'm not going to move. It's valid. Now we can grow within our communities, but once we find our path and we're super secure and confident in that path, we can respect each other and then we can love each other. And then we can be united and with that we can solve all of our issues and have a machine. So what could we do? What could we do to make this happen? Here's my ideas. If you have any ideas, I really want to hear them. I want you to email me at kaylahaber at gmail.com and tell me your ideas. Tell me how you want to get involved. First of all, I'm in the middle of writing another book and it's called 70 Faces and it goes through 70 different types of Jews. There's no way an exhaustive list. And it goes through 70 different types of Jews, their origin, their history, the context, how they came about, the evolution of them and what they keep and what they do and how they hold just so that we can understand the context and nuance of each group of people and respect them. I'm writing it in the, in curriculum format so that it can be taught in schools. So the first thing I think is education. Fun fact, I actually started writing this book in high school when the three boys from Gush Katif were taken and there was this whole thing about unity. I actually started writing it then. It didn't end up happening. I'm writing it now. And that's my first idea. My second idea is to do some events. Now, I really want to do this, like giant event. Get all other Instagrammers and people from different religious backgrounds to post about it so that different Jews from different religious backgrounds come and have everybody like laugh, have fun, not be a serious event, be like a fun, an awesome event because I do believe that laughing together and having fun together causes people to break down those barriers and humanize each other the way we humanize each other when we're in pain, but instead do it when we're having fun so that we don't have to be in pain for it to happen. My... Next idea was, and this is what I'm really excited about, was to conduct a series of interviews on my Instagram page, which I'm then going to turn into one large video on my YouTube channel, where we bring people on live from different religious backgrounds and open up the floor for people to ask them any question they want. We'll have a series of questions that we ask each one, like standard questions, but then also this curiosity and looking into it and just seeing people for what they are and the context and understanding each other in a very like no judgment zone everything is safe to say zone I feel like it can really break down those barriers and help us understand each other as valid and understand where we're coming from when we keep all those different mitzvahs the different ways that we do I think that could be really cool and then can consolidate them into one larger video that can be shared because I just think that it would be so incredibly awesome to see the different answers to the different questions and the validity of all of them, the tradition of all of them, the way that they're all thought out and it's not just people being lazy or crazy for no reason. I really think that that's important. There's one more idea that we had, which was to create core groups in different communities that practice this kind of lifestyle of being secure in themselves and open to others and have them like satellite groups in each community so that they can then spread that behavior within their community and create WhatsApp support groups or any kind of support group for those people so that when they're struggling with something or they're like, well, I feel like I really am upset at these specific people, we can talk about it, we can have a safe place where we can talk about it and slowly expand those circles in a very safe way and in an understanding way. And when we hit those you know, checkpoints of like, this is difficult, what do I do with this? But I'm not sure about this, but this is really upsetting. Talk it through and understand how we can get to a place of loving and respecting each other, not hating each other, agreeing to disagree. These are my ideas. If you have any ideas, you can email me and let's make this happen because we really can't afford not to.